All right, welcome back, everybody. We are back live. Um, and tonight we are going to start with recognition. So we have with us Concord Ed Fund, and we have Jen Perry, Trish Seifer, both co presidents, and then we have Greg Legault and Bill Stone that are co chairs of the Grants Committee. So welcome, everybody. We are uh, happy to have you with us, and I'll turn it over to you. Can you just grab a mic? I know. Um, if you can grab the one behind you, maybe, and pass that. Oh, no. George's a pretty long one. Thank you. Because this one is loud in the room, and that one just is for the... It is working. You won't hear it in the room, but it is working for our viewers at home. Thank you so much for having us. Um, and on behalf of the Concord Education Fund, we want to thank all of you and our amazing teachers and administrators for all they do for our children. Um, we've had an amazing record-breaking year. Um, over the past 29 years in total, we've granted over $3 million to the Concord Public Schools. Very proud of that. Wow. This year, we've had more applicants than we've had over the past five years. We had over 20 applications, and we awarded um, over $113,000 with worth of grants, which is more than double what we did last year. I mean, I'll have Bill, our grants committee chair, explain some details about the grants. Sure. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, I'm Bill Stone. Um, yeah, our process is pretty simple. Uh, we raise funds, we take grants, and then we award the grants. Uh, this year... The total award was 114,767. And um, I think we had a total of 14 grants that we awarded, uh, some out of cycle, some in cycle. And again, um, grant applications were up. I think we we're over 20 this year, like Trish said, but on average over the last like three, four years, we we're probably in the lower teens. So, and that includes COVID. So it's actually, I think we're out of COVID. I think things are going well. Um, the average awards that we've done over the last couple of years is probably in the 70s. And this year's 114. So we're very happy to, to work with you guys on this. And we have a really nice check to show you. <laughs> oh, and uh, Trish wanted me to talk about trends. Um, some of the trends that, that we see, the, the three trends that we see probably in the last four years uh, start with wellness, um, mental health, and diversity and inclusion. That's kind of one of the, one of the um, grant trends that we're getting. We're also getting um, outdoor and innovative ways, innovative ways of learning, um, getting these kids out of classroom, sensory motor pathways, things like that. Um, and then the other is just kind of straight innovation. Uh, this year, I think we awarded some funds for robots for the high school and the middle school, right? Um, those, those are the three categories that we get. And, and it's been pretty consistent over the last couple of years. Um, we are getting grants from all of the schools, uh, elementary, um, high school, middle school. And there's a lot that kind of overlap, like the robotics in the high school and the middle school. But one other item this year, we got our first one from the um, CIPS. Yeah. So we're, we're really, really excited about that. Um, one of the other things that we like to do, if we get a grant from Willard and it's for, this year was uh, diverse de decodable text, we like to sh kind of go back to Alcott and throw and say, hey, we got this grant, um, do, do, does everybody want, want a piece of this? And, and more often than not, they do. So we, we're trying to kind of make sure that, that, that things are even across all three. And that's that's kind of it. Those, those that's the trends. Um, we're excited to work with you guys on this. And and please, anyone watching, just you know, faculty, staff, please keep them coming. Thank you so much. And we are going to accept your check, but I think you have a big giant check with you today. Yeah, they do. <laughs> I know we have a paper check too that we're going to accept later in our meeting, but we're going to take a couple pictures okay. before we start. The big camera court. Oh, I don't have a camera court. It's got it. You got it. Do I accept the check, Lori? Or do we have, are we? Have should you be in it? You should get in the picture. Should we be in it? No. Yeah, you need to be in it. Take one to okay. send me yeah. for social media. Can you pull that, Carrie? Can you pull that microphone down? This one? That is just out of the picture. No, the one right in front of you. Oh, me. Yeah. We can't take this one down to the bank. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. 
I'd love to express a, a special thanks for what you said about how you seek equity across the uh, the three elementaries um, by inviting people to pay attention to what's happening in one because that idea that uh, uh, the inspiring idea in one school gets your support but then might lead to a similar kind of excitement in other schools I think is super important. Yeah. We've seen not recently but years years back where there was some inequity in what was mm -hmm. happening in the way of growth and in, in, in resources in the in the schools and it was difficult for those schools. So I think you, it's the same with the music program we've done something similar there. Yeah. 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 Thank you so so much for being so sensitive to that. Yeah. Trying. I know you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I do have to thank you for the balloons. Um, I'm not sure if people know this, but the Ed Fund is responsible for the balloons all over town for our seniors. Oh, yes, yeah. That's a fundraiser. And I thank you probably have teacher appreciation coming up too. So there are lots of ways to give to the Ed Fund. So. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so thank you so much for all of that. Thank you. And this goes, um... <laughs> it changes every year, so we're trying to make that number on the right a little bigger, right? A little bigger, yeah, right? Yeah. You guys are welcome. If you want to display, that's yeah, we could it. display it in our room too. Yeah, yeah that'd be cool. cool. Yeah, right. Very good. Thank, Thank you guys. Right. Thank you all so much. It makes a difference. Take care. We can scan that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you can scan it. So it's our first recognition. We're going a little bit out of order tonight. And next, we are very excited to have our retirees. And we have a few attending in person. And do you want to? So the principals will do the introductions oh, if you just want to invite them to do that maybe by school. By school. Okay. So why don't we start with, we'll start with the preschool. Do we have some? Kristen's going to grab oh, the Kristen, preschool. Go ahead. So I'd like to thank Donna Balmuth for 29 years of service to the Concord Public Schools. She started her first day and only day at the Concord Middle School. And after that, it was 29 years of Alcott and the preschool uh, combined. And now it's been at, at preschool as our occupational therapist. So thank you uh, to all her tremendous work over the years. And not here tonight, we want to recognize Polly King, the nurse here at Ripley, is also retiring. So we're grateful for her service as well. Okay, and next we'll go to Alcott. So is Naomi here? She is. Come on down. And we'll if you can grab the microphone over there too, that'd be great. You can wherever you want to be. Sit, it's really up to you. <laughs> sure. All right. Um, yes, I did. Um, so I am here to recognize Barbara Gordon, who is here. Um, so Barbara, it is very hard to believe that we need to say goodbye to you as Alcott's amazing art teacher. Um, and thinking about all that you have brought to our community, it's really hard to know where to start. Um, I could certainly name all of your varied accomplishments from your 23 years with the Concord Public Schools, uh, from the children you've inspired to the community art installations you've cultivated to the amazing interdisciplinary work you've done with your colleagues. Your work is visible throughout the school. In fact, um, you pretty much set the tone for the whole school as you are the first room that people see when you enter the building. Um, I've given a lot of tours recently to prospective students um, and their eyes just light up when they sort of see what they're going to be able to do. I have not had the heart to tell them that will not be their teacher next year. <laughs> um, so in addition to all of your accomplishments and the impact you've had on students in the community, I also just want to reflect on some of the personal characteristics that have made you such an integral part of our community, your commitment to our students, your ever-present lens on equity, your staunch advocacy for all students and your colleagues are just remarkable. Um, and on a personal note, I can't imagine starting next year without you. Uh, I don't know what I will do without your periodic check-ins, your sharing of joys and challenges, though I am very happy for you as you embark on this next chapter. I, like the rest of the Alcott community, will miss you very, very much. Mm.
We also have another retiree from Alcott who is not here today, um, and that is our nurse, Paula Amante. Um, I will save my words for her for our last day of school when she is here, but um, she got us through COVID, so I feel like that's enough said, but I, I have some words to share with her when, when she is uh, present. So those are our retirees. Thank you. And next up we have Willard, Mr. Lucy here. There he is. Very good fortune to speak about Sharon Hain today. Sharon? <laughs> So many of you know Sharon. Sharon's been with uh, the schools for 23 years. She was a um, co-teacher in fifth grade, special educator. She was uh, our uh, English language uh, arts curriculum specialist. But she's also a person who embodies the idea of uh, leading with yes. So let me tell you a little bit about that. Sharon, um, when she was a teacher and her co-teacher needed to collaborate more closely or change curriculum in the moment, she would lead with yes. When a student needed help and wasn't ready to uh, identify themselves as needing help, she would lead with yes. When a parent was anxious and unsure about a child and their well-being, she would lead with yes, let's talk. When she came on board as the ELA specialist, we were in a position where we needed to uh, do some more work in building our curriculum readiness. She led with yes. When we needed instructional de delivery of a different type, uh, Sharon is um, a trainer for the Wilson Language System, um, which is uh, one of the premier systems of teaching students who um, sometimes struggle with language acquisition. And um, Sharon, when we came on board uh, six years ago, when I started working with her six years ago, we had about three members of the staff mm -hmm. that were certified as uh, Wilson uh, certified uh, reading specialists. Now we have more than 12. To that end, to, to uh, really underscore the kind of person that Sharon is, her training is so complete, so successful that this year, one of our members of staff at Willard has been identified as one of only two people, educators in the nation to receive a scholarship to continue to do more work by Wilson. So that that uh, individual will be um, feted this um, summer, as will Sharon in the annual conference in Boston. But talk about leading with yes, during the pandemic, um, we needed remote uh, learning academy teachers. Sharon reluctantly, but did say yes. <laughs> no, she did not. <laughs> Whenever there's a challenge, Sharon says yes. Um, when um, I needed a teacher at the end of the school year due to a, 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 a situation where there was a member of staff who uh, had to leave for medical reasons, I turned to Sharon and I knew that Sharon would say yes when I needed her to cover a classroom. And when we had a, a, a second semester flood of her office <laughs> during her last months of school, many of us, I'll admit, I might have said no, I can't, I can't do it. Sharon, in that day, with some help, moved all her office and was delivering services the next day to students. She leads with the yes and leaves a legacy of, of, of being such a positive, forceful, and caring person. So Sharon, thank you for always leading with yes. And we look forward to staying in contact, but enjoy the time moving forward when you can say no. <laughs> All right, and now we're at the middle school. So I think is Olive, Olive here. here. Come on up. Mr. Cameron's in Washington, D.C. with the eighth grade. So Ms. Bradford's pitching here tonight. Shout out to any parents who did drop off at 30 this, 30 this morning, morning, if you can yeah. stay awake for the rest of the week. Oh, thank you. So the middle school had uh, five retirees this year, and I wish all of you could have been present last week for our celebration and watch the colleagues um, celebrate these teachers. There were songs, there were speeches, um, and just so much joy. I will not do justice to, to the words that were said last week. Um, but tonight we have with us um, what became the joke. So we two Sharons, so it sounds like three Sharons retired tonight, <laughs> um, and an Elizabeth. 
Um, so Sharon Kabelitz um, is a sixth grade science teacher um, currently in the Peabody building and was one of the first teachers I met when I came to Concord Middle School. Um, her passion for science and her love of her home base were the two things that, that stood out right away. Home base is our advisory program. And anytime you go into Sharon's home base, it's just what it should be, the family. Um, she knows those students so well. And if she's ever not there, they say, where is Ms. Kaplitz? Nice to see you, Ms. Bradford, but we'd really rather have Ms. Kaplitz. Um, and that enthusiasm and community is in your in your science classes as well. Um, Sharon has a phenomenal collection of science dresses uh, from sloths to, what am I missing? <laughs> There's one for every unit, <laughs> mushrooms. Um, and then Sharon was also a CTA rep in our building. Um, I had never worked in a, a union district before um, and didn't know what that experience would be like. And I think Sharon just models the role so beautifully, um, such an advocate for teachers, um, and it, by by helping them, um, as well as advocating with admin, but also saying, who needs a break during MCAS? I'll come do a bathroom break. Um, this is really the way that we can work as teachers together to support students. So that was a great education for me. So thank you to Sharon for 15 years. Elizabeth Stockwood is our librarian who's been at Concord for 18 years. Um, one of my favorite things that Elizabeth said is libraries aren't supposed to be quiet. <laughs> if you're ever in the library at CMS, kids are talking, they're talking about books, they're working in the makerspace, they're working in groups on projects. Um, Elizabeth invites classes in on a regular basis, works with teachers, make sure that reading isn't just something that students are doing by themselves, but is really part of the community experience. Um, and I think it will be incredibly hard for, for any, you, you are the library at CMS, um, and I, our, Kelly has huge shoes to fill, so thank you so much for all you've done to make that space special in two buildings. <laughs> and finally, our second Sharon, it's 31 years, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so Sharon Staggers Moss is an institution at Concord Middle School. Um, no matter how late any of the administration leaves, Sharon seems to be there. Um, I'm, I'm still convinced you hole up in the nurse's office overnight sometimes. I don't. <laughs> um, but, but the truth of it is her, her science classes, um, students talk about them for years. I found a couple high schoolers wandering around at Sanborn. I said, what are you doing? Oh, we're here to see Ms. Decker's boss. <laughs> Come back to visit. Um, but that's only about half of your, your job, Sharon, right? The, the teaching of science. Her extracurricular work is unbelievable. Um, when I was hearing about the grant for the robots, I was looking at you. Um, the Lego robotics program is incredibly popular. Um, students compete year after year with great success. The sixth graders come over looking a little nervous in the beginning of the year and then are um, just can't stop talking about that club um, during their school days from there on. So. Thank you um, for everything that you have done, and we will see you around, I think. <laughs> and I think we have two middle school teachers not with us. We yeah. have Paul Crowley, who is in Bernie Wetstrom. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> and then on to the high school with principals Miller and Stahl. Come on up. So we have um, eight folks retiring, and we have I oh Deb Smith it's is back. Zoom. Yep, Deb Wait, Zoom. She was here and then gone, and um, so Deb is on yep. Zoom, and we have Sandy Hopped. Sorry. So let me just mention the six um, other folks. We've got Bo Fang, Noir Murphy, Elaine Picard, Todd Sawyer, Ingrid Sutter, and um, Linda Vice Heisey. So similar to what Olive mentioned, we had a wonderful celebration, um, was meant to be at Barrel Farm. Then there was enormous thunderstorms on Friday night and we moved it to the, they moved it miraculously to the Scout House. Um, so it was a great time and I certainly can't do justice to all of that was said, um, but I can, I'm just gonna say a few things about each of these folks that are here. Um, so Sandy's uh, one of the smartest people you'll ever met with a million advanced degrees. Uh, she's taught, taught statistics and math at CC for a really long time. And math isn't always everyone, every student's favorite subject. Um, but she has 
intense and incredible care for her students. She wants them to learn math, but she also just wants them to become good problem solvers and good thinkers and good people. And Sandy was a late addition to our retirement board, and we are going to miss you, but we wish you the very best. And I would just like to say, Sandy, um, your department, you are so beloved by your department, and I know how hard this decision was for you, and I'm so happy for you that you feel good about it and that you are ready. We wish you the absolute best and hope you will come back and visit us. Well, we get the fall. We get a first, yeah. we get a first quarter, so. <laughs> Um, I already lined her up to cover a substitute need. <laughs> and um, the second person we're going to talk about is Deb Smith. So nobody had it easy teaching during COVID, but I would say chorus teachers where you're meant to be singing might have had it the hardest. Um and Deb never gave up. She was always getting creative. We were, she was making music videos outside, some of which she won Emmys for, which was just um, awarded. And she, her, her Gram, yeah, Grammy, Grammy, forgive me. Um, Brian and pop culture aren't the not, not yeah. <laughs> Emmy, not Grammy, Emmy. <laughs> oh, right. I wish, I wish Grammy, but no. <laughs> I <stand> corrected. <laughs> a broken clock is right twice a day. Um, but Deb's passion for kids singing and for creating a, it's more than just singing. I think that the students who go to her class, that's their space. That's where they feel comfortable. That's where they want to be for lunch. That's where they want to be before school. That's where they want to be after school. And I don't think that's the case in all choral programs. Deb has created a space where all kids feel comfortable and she's done amazing work for that. And Deb and I have worked together for a ton of years and Deb, you have, you deserve this and I wish you the very best. And I would just say, if you have not seen the video, check out the video. It is quite amazing and something we will forever be proud of, Deb. So congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. All you have to do is Google, you raise me up conquered inside YouTube and it comes right up. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Great, thank you so much. Good luck to our retirees. And we are not offended if you um, would like to leave. Feel free to stay. We love having you with us. Yes, yes. I mean, I know you have important things to do. So thank you so much. Best of luck in retirement. All right, and our last recognition of the night is to our new Thoreau School principal, Justin Sparks. So come on. So I'll just introduce Justin really quickly and then I'll let him introduce himself, but come on and sit. Uh, so Justin comes to us from Fitchburg where he's a sitting elementary principal wrapping up the year in a busy way. We've been sharing field trip stories and other big <laughs> events here tonight. Um, he comes out of the classroom to the principalship at the elementary level. So we're really excited about the instructional experience and background that he brings and all the work he's done at Fitchburg demonstrates such strong instructional and um, leadership of all kinds, besides just the data diving and the academic growth, but the climate and the social emotional and all the other needs that elementary schools have in 2023. So we're excited to have him start to transition and visit. He'll be at the row all day Friday with Angel and the staff and um, start to get acclimated a little bit there and then start with us officially in July. That's great. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Hunter, and thank you for having me here tonight. What an honor and privilege it was to just watch that, to bear witness to um, a celebration and an acknowledgement of uh, years and decades worth of service. That's tremendous. So I appreciate being a part of that. You can tell the Concord Ed Fund that Thoreau going forward would love to have a part of the big check. <laughs> <laughs> to partake. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, grateful to be here and start building relationship with all of you um, and giving me the opportunity to introduce myself to the boards, two boards. To, to I'm still getting a handle on the structure, yeah, um, uh, and, and the and the the greater community of uh, Concord and Concord Carlisle. So, as Laurie mentioned, um, finishing up my fourth year as uh, the instructional leader of Rheingold Elementary School in Fitchburg, similar uh, model to what we have here at Thoreau, um, you know, in, in in a lot of ways. 
uh, lived through some challenging times through uh, the pandemic, through some tragedies, through some building issues, which seem to also occur from time to time around this. <laughs> um, and, and also a lot of successes because of the teamwork that we've been able to do in the culture that Laurie mentioned. We were able to um, bring our accountability rating from 4% to 26 to 43% over the course of a, a four-year span. So we're really proud of that. Um, mixed emotions leaving, but I'm very excited to be joining such a strong team and one dedicated to providing excellent instruction to all, all of our students here. So um, before that, I spent 15 years in the classroom, uh, teaching first, second, third, a little bit of fourth, uh, worked in special education for a little while. So um, looking forward to putting those, um, you know, that, that, that past practice to work. Uh, but most importantly, I'm the proud dad of two amazing kids. I have a middle school boy, Luke, um, trying to navigate the middle school right now has been a challenge, mm -hmm. uh, but we're working through it. And uh, a daughter, Phoebe, who's just finishing up uh, first grade, she's eight years old. So um, yeah, I take that parent mentality with me into the into this new role, and I'll never forget that. Um, additionally, I uh, have a lot of respect for what you all do um, as the um, outgoing school committee member. I um, just finished up my second three-year term on the Ashburnham Westminster Regional School District. Um, so it was a, a mm. I can't think of a better way to give back to your community and and, and truly serve the students and, and children of Concord and, and, and Carlisle. Um, but I also know that is a thankless job at times. Um, you put in long hours. Um, uh, the work sometimes does not get noticed. Um, I appreciate all you do for, for, the, for the district here. Um, so yeah, like uh, Dr. Hunter mentioned, um, I'll be here a lot this summer. Um, I'll be in the building a lot. Uh, I'll have regular opportunities to engage and connect as much as you'd like to. Love to have you in and hear about your experiences here and what I can bring to the table and how we can partner going forward. I'll be here all day on Friday working with Angel, um, who has been so supportive and, and welcoming to me in my transition um, as she's looking to transition into her new role and finish up the year in a positive, strong way. She's um, committed to making sure that this transition is is a, is a success. Um, and as I'm leaving and kind of have a foot in two worlds, I understand that, um, it, you know, it's a challenge to do both things. You're stretched thin. So appreciate that. And as I was mentioning to Laurie and, and, and Kristen and, and Bob, um, you know, it was a, a difficult choice, but with every step in the process from the first round of interviews, um, you know, the 20, 20 odd people we had in the room <laughs> or so. Uh, and then the, and then the second round where I got the chance to get into the school and visit, meet with parents and, and staff and, and do some visits. The, the joy of learning was noticeable across the row. And uh, again, the commitment to excellence. So I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm really excited to be joining such a strong team here um, and, and, and serving the kids of these communities. So thank you for the opportunity. And again, um, my email's up and running now, so feel free to reach out anytime. Um, love to grab a coffee and catch up. Yeah. Happy to answer any questions that you may have, or I can step back and look. Well, we really want to welcome you tonight. You picked a great night to come because you have the entire leadership team really in this room. <laughs> and they're a great group of people that I think you're really going to love working with. So it, it's really a, a strong team in our district. So welcome. Does anyone have any questions or? No. I think we, we're all thrilled to have you. We're all excited to have you on board. Thank yeah. you so much. You're welcome. Look forward to coming back here, maybe, and not talking about myself, but bringing some student leaders with me. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> we love it anytime. Thank you Great so night. much. Yeah. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. No plans yet. All right. All right. So moving on to our consent agenda. This is the first for us here tonight. So um, one edit. One edit. Okay. okay. Go on the community, the Concord Ed Fund number, one of the grants went up $1,267. So the number that you need to vote tonight instead of what's listed there is 56,593,000. ,593 That's the delta between the responsive classroom number you approved in the winter and the number you heard from them today of 114,767. So I will ask school committee, does anyone have anything they'd like to remove from the consent agenda? No, I see nothing. Would you like to make a motion? I will Ms. make Anderson? a motion. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda as written on our agenda, requesting that individual items on the agenda are um, noted in the minutes. 
Do you have a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Right? Wow. That was so easy. It's just nice. so easy. Perfect. <laughs> All right, moving on to our CCHS students, and it's always a treat to have them with us. I see Harry and Felicity, and I don't see Zaria. Okay. Yeah, Zaria's unfortunately not gonna be able to make it tonight, but um, I think she's able to look over the presentation and everything, so. Still have a little bit of input from her. I can just share my screen, just give me one minute. Okay, perfect. Um, so elections concluded last week for both student senate and class government, so. We're looking forward to hitting the ground running again next fall, and we should have a good group of people put together. So hopefully we'll be able to get a lot of stuff done. And then also um, French students from the high school went on a trip to the MFA to see art that they've been talking about in class from French artists last week. I have a lot of friends who went on the trip and they said it was a lot of fun. Um, and last week we also had the eighth grade tours from CMS in Carlisle and I think a couple of other schools as well. And it was, I was one of the like tour guides. So it was really nice to just walk around with the eighth graders and see, I think um, we're going to have a really great freshman class next year. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and the seniors of course graduated. I was there. It's always really great to kind of celebrate our seniors like that and I always like the speeches and things and this year was no different so congratulations to all the seniors and yeah we're really looking forward to the year ahead. Yeah and sophomores we had bio MCAS today and our last day is tomorrow so we're also wrapping up um, the end of the year and we also have the school is going to be running a flex block trial this Thursday, which is part of the new like bell schedule. That's basically like a study, but you can go for extra help with different classes. And I think that's one of the biggest changes. So, so far there's uh, initially there was like some skepticism, but I think that now that um, now that people have gotten a chance to discuss the schedule, they've become like more receptive to it. And it'll be really interesting to see how that goes on Thursday. Yeah, definitely. I would just second that. I think when people saw the different options for places they could go and they logged into the software we're using for the first time, people started to be a little bit more receptive to it. And then, of course, finals start this Friday. So we're really in the home stretch here at the high school. All right, I have a question on the uh, the software. Is it a phone app or is it on the computer? Um, it's Yeah, it's a website right now. It's called MyFlex Learning. Um, it's super easy to use. You can log into it and they have a listing of all the different classes. And then also different teachers can request you. So if they think that you would benefit from extra help in a class or even just like as an opportunity for some learning in a smaller group setting, they can almost like sign you up to be there. Like it. A phone. There is a, there is an app too. You can do it either way. Oh, I love it. Oh. Thursday is the big day, the big trial. I've heard a little bit about this. Maybe yes. Felicity, I wanted to tell you, I thought your end of the year article in the bridge oh. was so exceptional and positive and just rounded out the year so well. And I say that because my mother and my husband's mother are inclined to flip everything like from our lives. And so I pulled out my 1994 Conquer journal and the article, I don't, a student did not write it all the quotes, I don't know where this journalist roamed around to, but every quote from someone in my class was like, this place is getting on my nerves. I'm just glad to get out of here. It was it was the most wild article I've ever written. And in contrast, yours was one of like joy and positivity. So um, kudos to you. I thought it was a far superior article um, to the one. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It was also really exciting for me because I like really I have a lot of senior friends, so it was like really bittersweet to be able to work with a lot of them for the article. So it was awesome. It was great. Thank you. Firing that you rounded up. Well, another wonderful report from you guys. We have one more meeting um, next week and the next, we're not sure about next year yet, right? Or it's up to their board. To okay. Decide. Cause I did, let's see, I thought I saw your QR code with like running for school committee rep. Do you actually have to run for rep? In Senate? Yeah, that was, uh, so we had the elections and they concluded last week. So Harry and I had some competition, but we both got reelected. So oh, it's still going to be us next year. Congrats, guys. 
So, Thank you. Light, well, I, it's a sought after spot. It, it, is, <laughs> it is. So nice job in your campaigns. All right. So we'll see you guys next year. Congrats to you both. This week um, will be our last meeting of the year. So All congratulations right. and thank you. Thank you. All thank right. you both. All right. Moving on to public comment. So we are entering into the public comment section of the meeting. We will start with public comment in the room first. And as a reminder, you will have three minutes. This is a meeting in the public, not with the public. So the school committee will not be responding. So any public comment from the room? No, moving online. And I see two hands raised. So we will start with um, Elizabeth Frank. Thanks so much. Okay, hi. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Frank, uh, 1283 Elm Street. Um, sorry, just pulling up what I want to say. <laughs> um, so I'm here to express my appreciation for Dr. Hunter's five-year strategic plan uh, for the school district that she presented last meeting. Um, I'm really heartened that inclusion is one of the four main areas of focus and that there are so many specific initiatives and ambitious goals in this area. I've heard many stories from parents with children of color in Concord where their kids haven't felt included and instead have been made to feel different or bad because of their differences. Um, and making sure that all students do feel included and a sense of belonging is so important. And I know we as a school district and as a community have a ways to go. So I'm just so glad that Dr. Hunter and the district are making this a priority uh, and I look forward to supporting the schools in these efforts. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I see another hand, um, Heidi Kay. Yes, um, I'm going to read a statement. This is Heidi Cater, 100 Elmbrook Lane in Concord. So for the record, I'd like to read a public statement about my opposition to building a cell phone tower on the CCH campus. That's going to be discussed later. It's my sincere hope that the school committee defers the decision to install a cell tower to the community-wide vote in both Concord and Carlisle. There seems to be a clear agenda to push the cell tower installation through quickly under the guise of safety, but keep in mind that parents have managed just fine without mobile student contact for decades. Regarding the temporary token plan to install safety phones by the playing fields and on campus, my hunch is that there'll be a subsequent claim that they're not offering enough in terms of safety, and then the agenda to install <clears throat> the cell tower will proceed. SC and admin should further investigate the telltale signs of EMR sickness and look for that in staff and student body. If a cell tower is installed, that would include, and I repeated from last time, nausea, nosebleeds, headache, vomiting, increase in brain cancer rates, loss of sleep, agitation, loss of concentration and focus, skin rash, loss of taste and smell, tinnitus, heart palpitations, and more. The SC should consider the health, health ramifications of EM radiation, especially for those with the disability of hearing loss who wear hearing aids. This is a Disability Act issue that should be further pursued. Have you considered how the school would respond to students who wear hearing aids and complain of buzzing or interference in their hearing aids? I also urge you as a committee to investigate Mass House Bill H2158, which seeks to recognize EM sensitivity as a public health concern. There's a town regulation that no cell tower can be built within a thousand feet of a school building. I'd like to request that the school committee share how far from any school building the proposed cell tower sites are. Um, the ABC, or I'm not sure if they're numbered one, two, three proposed sites seem to be within or close to that a thousand foot limit regulation. Also, there needs to be discussion about monitoring EM radiation levels inside the school if a tower were to be built what device would be used to do that and who would monitor the levels. It's my opinion that such a company should be an outside neutral one, not Verizon or Concord. It's my humble opinion that a cell tower should not be installed on any school campus in the town of Concord. And finally, I'd like to give a shout out to the middle school teachers who just retired. After 30 plus years of teaching, this would have been the year that I retired. Had I not been denied a family medical leave, lied to by administration and fired. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on to, let's see, any other hands raised? No. Nope. Public comment is now closed and we are on to correspondence. Would you like to start with CPS? I think the only CPS correspondence was Thanks ones that we were CC'd on the vision. So, um, we had four pieces of correspondence. Uh, one was on the incident on the Boston bus at the middle school. 
uh, two pieces of correspondence were about the cell phone tower at CCHS, and we had one piece that came in today on early literacy. And I think that's all we have. All right. On to now our discussion, which is our school improvement plan. So we look forward to this every year, seeing our principals here and our assistant principals here. It's really exciting for us to see all the work that you've done this past year and what we have to look forward to. So it really is a treat for us. I'm hoping it's just as much of a treat for you to be here. Um, but, you know, last year we had a lot of fun with it. So I'm thinking that it, it's going to be just as great as it was last year. So without further ado, we will start with Alka. Do you... Would you like to say anything, Dr. Hutcher, or are we? I think while Naomi comes up and are you, the three of you coming together? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's really, yeah, come together and then you can rotate through. Um, just the completion of the strategic plan was the driver behind these improvement plans. So listen for the threads that hold it all together. No, so for the public, we have Alcott, Thoreau, and Willard. So we have Ms. Krakow, Ms. Charles, and Mr. Lucy. If I'm saying your name correct, Naomi, I feel like I get it wrong every time. Krako. It is Krako. Long Krako. A, long O. Okay, thank you so much. I respond to just about anything said politely. So, <laughs> well, welcome. Um, so I guess I will kick us off. I think um, if you've looked at the plans, you'll notice that there are um, some sort of consistent through lines in all three of them. Um, and we've each chosen just a couple of things that we want to highlight um, because they feel pretty uh, important to our buildings. Um, so I think one thing that um, I have noticed and want to highlight with um, Alcott's plan is just how interconnected everything is, um, which I think is because some of so many of the strategic initiatives as they were developed by the task force um, are all they're all very related. Um, and so you'll notice that a lot of the things in Alcott's plan are are, are quite um they're nicely connected. Um, so one of the things that I just wanted to highlight is that after several years of focusing on rolling out our MTSS system for literacy and math, which is by no means like, you know, finalized, we're going to keep on working on it um, and working to improve it. But we are, um, with a couple of years of that under our belt, shifting to focus on uh, developing an MTSS multi-tiered system of support for social emotional learning and mental health, um, which is coming out of work from a task force this year. Um, we had teacher leaders who are a part of that committee. Um, they've applied for some summer work um, funding to get to work on that with me this summer. Um, and so we're really excited about that. We're going to be looking at um, doing sort of a needs assessment to see where we're at, but then also looking at what we need to do to really shore up our tier one supports and then also um, look at what we need to do for tier two and tier three. We have a lot of things in place, but I think that this is giving us an opportunity um, to just be really planful and, and look at it and be really purposeful in our work with that. Um, very related to that initiative um, is work that we are really excited to do with Responsive Classroom, um, which is also connected to the Concord Ed Fund grants that were um, given out earlier today. Um, so we had a couple of classrooms pilot that this year. Um, we are looking to adopt it um, more broadly across the school. So we have um, our goal is to have other teachers get trained this summer. We're not aiming to have the entire school implement next year because it's a really big rollout. And so it'll take a little bit of time, um, but we're really excited to bring that um, into the school at a larger scale. Um, I think one of the reasons I'm really excited about it is that one of our teachers who piloted it this year, and we only had a couple of teachers pilot it this year, but one of the teachers who did it um, in presenting to the staff to try to sort of get support around this, uh, one of the things she said, I think, was uh, it brought joy back to my practice, um, which was just so nice to hear. Um, and so we're really excited to bring that, um, which I think connects really nicely to the third thing I wanted to highlight, which is... Um, the work that our cultural competency committee is going to be doing in partnership with our DEIB teacher lead, um, just continuing. So it's work that we started this year, um, but we are going to continue sort of examining our own implicit biases, um, ensuring, so just as some examples, um, ensuring that Alcott's own traditions and celebrations are fully inclusive, um, and then really just looking for ways to build connection and belonging. And that is in students, but also staff, um, which is where responsive classrooms just ties in very nicely to that because um, that's one of the big tenets of responsive classroom. Um, so those are those are a couple of things out of the very big 
plan, um, but we're really excited about them. Hi, everyone. It's bittersweet to be sharing my last school improvement plan with all of you. Um, but I have to say, we did have um, a wonderful school advisory council that helped us put this together, and it was fantastic, collaborative, and I'm very proud of the work that we did together. So a couple of things that I'd like to highlight. One thing that we are really excited about, specifically around multiple paths to success, is adopting and implementing the new data platform, the warehouse that we're going to have to finally have one clearinghouse to house all of our student assessment data. Um, currently, I think all of the schools use their own in-house homegrown, which has been wonderful. And you know, if you've been using it long enough, we have historical data to go back and look at students you know, from the time that they were in kindergarten and we can track them all the way up. But we're really excited to implement the new data warehouse so that we can track students beyond the elementary years into the high school. So we're super excited about that. Um, Let's see, another aspect that we're very excited about um, and that might be unique, and I was um, I was surprised and impressed at how important um, the issue around staff, mental health, and teacher attention was to our Student Advisory Council. So um, at the row, I think this is the first time we've had any sort of initiative or bullet um, targeting the idea of you know, promoting opportunities for faculty and staff to connect, recharge, um, and just sustain the work as it's become increasingly difficult. So that's something I never thought I would share, but really excited about. Um, the third thing I want to share, and there are so many I could go on and on, um, with regards to innovative learning environment, um, besides uh, looking at ways and revisiting the ways in which we use space to better highlight um, student work, using student spaces as um, an opportunity to highlight teaching tools. Like, so how can our displays become tools for teaching and celebrating diversity within our community? Um, as you know, um, we have, we're excited to have a feasibility study um, on our grounds in the coming year to address issues around erosion, parking, and how we're going to maintain outdoor spaces. Um, one thing that may be a contributing factor, but also something that students love, which we kind of chuckle about, is that we found that we need to identify a space where students can engage in hands-on nature play, specifically digging. Um, so I think, <laughs> I, I think that because of the issues around erosion, um, if you come down behind the lower playground, some of our students just want to dig, and they have dug holes that they can stand into up to about here. Wow. Um, and it's a preferred activity for students in kindergarten all the way up through fifth grade. So looking for a place where they can do that safely and not you know, be doing any further damage to the grounds would be wonderful. But the need to dig is very strong. <laughs> I need to add that to Elder. <laughs> Yeah, it's something that we all struggle with, but no one talks about, but we're calling it right out because we they're you know three feet deep at this point. Um, Another um, thing that we're interested in um, continuing and improving, and um, we have a very close uh, partnership with our PTG, and they have helped us to completely dig out our current grounds for learning space. Um, it's been dug out with parent volunteers. We are incorporating more sensory play and more interactive features, and that will be a space where I've already seen more students in that space this year than I have in years past, probably because there's no more poison ivy. Mm -hmm. And all of the um, things that were dying have now been removed and it's a clean slate. So um, those are just a few things that I wanna highlight for the row. Thanks. And again, on the theme of shared themes, uh, <laughs> we had a, um, a similar conversation as part of our community at Willard about uh, the mental health and stability of our community. And it began earlier in the school year. Um, and it was a very open and honest conversation that we've had as a staff um, that the pandemic um, caused uh, us to have some challenges um, as a community, as if we're honest with uh, ourselves, it has occurred in our households in the greater community in our nation. So uh, we did not, uh, want to duck this and we wanted to say it out loud and by our work with uh, Kristen and bringing in restorative practices 
one of our initiatives this upcoming year will be really to dig into that. Um, and they are partnering with, with us. The group is called the Pathways to Restorative Communities, who is providing the professional development uh, to our staff and to ourselves. Um, and we'll be working with them closely to, um, to rebuild and to strengthen uh, the relationships we have. Um, so we're dedicating ourselves each faculty meeting to restorative circles, um, community building circles. Um, and through those re-engagements, we'll then be able to do our work even more successfully. Um, teachers, as you all know well, put themselves second. Um, and it's odd for all of us, and I'll speak for myself, to say what I need to do is think of myself and what I need and the relationships I need to rekindle in myself with others so I can do my best work with others. Um, so we're gonna be um, focusing in on that every month. We're gonna be doing work with uh, restorative justice, but with the backbone also of our work with a responsive classroom, because again, it's the micro to the macro. Um, um, and so that work that the um, Concord Ed Fund has supported us in, dovetails so beautifully and the timing couldn't be more appropriate to get this work done now. Um, so um, I'm grateful to Kristen and to Lori and working together with uh, you know uh, my colleagues to to be able to do this work and to be able to do it well, right? Um, so it's very exciting. We began this past year doing a, a series of interviews with staff and then we put, did a survey and then we uh, came back together and honed it further. But our work with the Pathways to Restorative Communities their roadmap for this upcoming year that we'll implement in our faculty meetings is really going to be very, very useful to us. And we look forward to the outcomes because it's gonna be, as we look after ourselves, we look um, we, as individuals, we look after each other as a community. And of course, then we can do our best work with our students. Um, on a lighter note, um, we're also going to be continuing to um, embolden our students to have voice. Um, so specifically in uh, the options for food, as I shared this past year, uh, there was uh, a student who came to me and said, I'd like to talk to you about changing uh, uh, some of the food in, in, the, in the dining hall because um, it's not halal, right? Mm -hmm. And and it was her voice and that of uh, others that was so well received by um, those who uh, make decisions about what's available in the kitchen that it, it, it made sense that we had voice and we had receptive uh, ears, right? And so we're gonna continue to do that. You'll notice on, on the school improvement plan, it's um, expand cafeteria food offerings that are healthy, tasty, and available to all students. So that doesn't mean, of course, available across all three, but all students who might enjoy, right, won't be denied the opportunity based upon their observances as a family. Right? So we're really excited about that. And then lastly, um, as you know, uh, we, uh, took full advantage of uh, the White Pond back a few years ago to park our cars. Right? <laughs> um, but then we've also expanded into using it as an educational resource. And then this past year, we really leveraged um, uh, Verrill Farm and specifically Mr. Verrill, right? And we've gone over and because we could just walk through the woods and we have um, learned from him. And one of these moments of appreciating a sage voice and um, uh, true wisdom, someone who has um, a great experience coupled with great knowledge. And so the students being able to authentically engage with the community um, as we think about the, uh, the three sisters that are above uh, the doors into Willard, um, the corn, beans, and squash, and when he can explain why that actually does work, right? Um, so we're, we're really excited about uh, the work that we're moving forward. I'm thrilled um, that we have some, um, some real ties together within the building. We're looking forward to having Justin join our team and to have Angel uh, available to us and to, to maintain the relationship of strength and caring um, and support for us in just a different role. So questions about our, our plans? Questions, anyone? Yeah, Cynthia, go ahead. So uh, in the spirit of listening to our community feedback, and I don't need the answer tonight, but we did get a letter from a CPAC board member regarding the reading curriculum that was just in the Alcott about the balanced literature, or what is it called? Liter literary, literary collaborative approach. Mm -hmm. It's Fountas and Pennell, which has come under some 
um, criticism lately. So it's yeah, I mean, so that's a district wide thing that's happening. We use literacy collaborative as a structure for our reading programs and actually throws way down the pathway well beyond Alcott. Um, we use that as a structure and a organizational approach. Mm -hmm. Um, however, we don't use Fountain Simpanel in its entirety and as a standalone program, which is what the criticisms are about. We supplement with foundations and a wide range of other phonetic tools, which is what the science of reading is all about. So it's not quite as simple as right. so maybe saying next it that our, way. You know, I know we did a very thorough uh, uh, presentation, uh, but maybe we could just go a little deeper because you know, if you watch, listen to the podcast, some teachers or specialists are like, it's not acceptable to use it in any way, shape, or form anymore. So maybe you could just describe the nuances of that to us. So. Mm -hmm. and, and just for one, just so no, no one has uh, the wrong idea in their head, the objections to Fountas and Pinnell are using it to teach phonics mm -hmm. and phonemic awareness, and we don't use it for that purpose. Okay. We use foundation for that okay. purpose. Yeah. Good. And then just one thing that jumped out at me, uh, responsive classroom was 15 at Alcott, 15 at Willard, but 50% pilot at a Thoreau. And that's correct. That's not a typo. Yeah, it was a choice for the teachers. Okay. If they wanted gotcha. to. But just critical masks. So yeah. we were early adopters. That's all. That's great. Yep, Carrie. Um, I have a question about the use of technology. We so full disclosure, I was on the like the broader strategic planning committee and my group was an innovative environment. And we had like a, several lengthy conversations about techno the use of technology and how that plays a role in environment. Um, and one of the one of my questions is you all kind of talked about the use of social media as an effective communication tool. But I'm curious beyond that, how do you think about it um, as far as like from both like educating families, this is probably more of a district wide question, the educating families about student use of social media, that piece, and then also, you know, the balance of technology in learning, um, the fact that students have to use computers and they have to learn how to type and they have to learn all of these things, but um, how do you talk about that? Yeah. And actually, Angel, one specific question for you is you talked about your advisory council. I'm curious if this came up with them as well. I'm glad that you asked. It did, actually. <laughs> so up until our very last meeting, actually, we had um, one of our um, specific things that we were going to do is to increase our presence on social media, mm -hmm. um, which led to a very long and thoughtful discussion about what is the purpose of social media within an elementary school environment? Who is it for? Who is it targeting? Is it for parents? Is it for the students? What What are you trying to get at? Is it trying to give. So we had this whole big conversation and we decided, you know, what would, what is the best way to alert families to the teaching and learning that's happening within the buildings and to let them know things that are going on. And our um, committee was very interested in finding alternate ways um, beyond social media or around social media to engage folks. Um, and I, I, that was surprising to me. I wasn't, I was anticipating that people would want more, I think, especially after COVID, want more of an inside lens into what was happening in the schools, but it seems like the feedback that I was receiving was now that we're back in, now that you're full steam ahead with volunteers and having people in the classroom, we want different. We don't just want to see, you know, photographs of kids. We want, how can we, you know, highlight what the students are learning as opposed to, you know, one moment in time. Mm -hmm. um, I know that we have also significantly reduced the amount our budget is funding various, you know, digital learning platforms. And we are, really steering the ship in the other direction to more, you know, interpersonal. We're trying to support the students to relearn how to work in groups and, you know, gather those communication skills. So um, I think you'll hopefully you saw an absence of a reliance on and, you know, adoption of new software and, and, you know, just digital anything because we're really trying to get back to, and we also acknowledge the impact that can have on student mental health even at the elementary level. So I think you, the absence, I'm glad you noticed it. <laughs> and if I could just add one thing, um, is that the uh, 
uh, Concord Carlisle's uh, Adult and Community Ed has, you know, taken under its uh, auspices the Center for Parents and Teachers and just got a big grant from the um, community chest to do more education for parents. And the topic for next year is on uh, the use of technology and specifically social media oh, and how to set boundaries with kids and so forth. So they're working on developing that. Great. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, mine's, mine's gonna be uh, a little funny, but when's the excavators coming? <laughs> come out and see. Come out and take a look at recess. You'll see that <laughs> all their glory. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, I love, you know, it's great the care that you take for our kids and also for our teachers. I mean, that was clear through all of your school improvement plans and, you know, and, and getting responsive classroom into your classrooms, but also thinking about the care that teachers also require. So yeah. I loved hearing that. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you for your support. Thank you, thank you guys. And okay. She's okay. So we're going to have Olive come up from the middle school and Katie and Brian from the high school, because this way you, you don't want Olive not to have any. You can you know, rely on each other, which is great. And we'll start with the middle school. And again, for anyone watching, Justin is on the DC trip, having all sorts of fun with the eighth grader. So That's thank right. you for coming to us tonight, Olive. Honored to be here presenting for my team. Um, so I have a, a rising kindergartner and a number of my friends and family keep asking, is she ready for kindergarten? And I have no idea how to answer that question besides to say we've done our best. Um, but my hope is that kindergarten is ready for her. Um, and I'm, I'm so <laughs> proud of our strategic plan and the, the middle school school improvement plan, because I think it's all about seeing our students as individual learners and meeting them where they are in and out of the classroom. Um, so at the middle school on the academic front, we're going to continue to use STAR assessments to assess kids in math and ELA. Our master schedule work over the last few years um, is work we're really proud of. It's allowed us space in our school days to target students for additional math, ELA, executive functioning, and social emotional support without pulling them out of core classes or specials. And the next step is really supporting teachers in developing stronger in-class practices for differentiating and supporting students who are learning in different ways and at different speeds. So our teaching and learning team, which is the group of department chairs, our focus for next year is this work, the question of who is a student or a group of students in your classroom who's struggling for whatever reason, and what are you going to try differently to target that group of students? Um, department chairs are going to be working with a number of different texts with teachers, um, we're using an instructional coaching model as well um, with that focus in mind. And then in January on a professional development day, um, similar to what we did this year, teachers are going to showcase um, success stories around this. So really that looking at that MTS um, level one, tier one in classroom practices. On the social emotional front, uh, we are adopting DESA. So that's the SEL screener being used by the high school and by the elementary schools already and refining our social emotional intervention practices in order to better teach SEL skills and strategies to students struggling in this area. Uh, this year was our first year working with PBIS, a positive behavior intervention system, uh, which we piloted. So we had three trimesters um, with core values, each the letters of CMS. So compassion was the first trimester value, motivation, second trimester, and self-awareness. Uh, and the idea of PBIS is to, to really focus on the positive. Um, sometimes in the, in the secondary level, the, the negative behaviors are what get all the attention. So how do we focus on positive behaviors we're looking for with students and reward those? Um, so that was the focus. We used our advisory program home base to, to teach explicitly what those different values look like um, and celebrated students who are exhibiting those on a daily basis. So we're going to continue that work next year. And it melds really nicely with the restorative justice work. Um, so restorative circles really are about building community. And again, it's setting the positive tone in the school building. Um, so that's going to be the format for home base. Next year, we had a number of, of teachers and leaders uh, do a restorative justice training that was offered district-wide this year. Um, and so the middle school is going to start with restorative justice, uh, excuse me, restorative circles as part of home base <clears throat> and also pilot restorative chats in places as well. Um, so the aim of those two programs are really to focus on the positive, um, build community, celebrate differences, and highlight positive behaviors um, rather than, again, focusing on the, the discipline needs. And then our innovative environment, I think it's funny, the, the building isn't on there. Uh, 
I can't wait to watch <laughs> that, that <laughs> construction. Um, as I think our, our students will too. We got to figure out yeah. how to yeah. capture that in, in photos. Um, but the two innovative environment initiatives are really in the same category of, of meeting students where they are. Um, we piloted a breakfast program uh, for students this, this spring to make sure all kids can start the day with access to a healthy meal. It makes a huge difference. Um, actually, you know, no hard data on this, but a couple of kids uh, just mood already, I've noticed, when they are able to get some calories in the morning. Um, and then next year, we are reconfiguring our, our health curriculum. Um, Kristen's going to lead that work with our health teachers and work with our IT department um, to really support students, uh, similar to what Angela is talking about, build healthy habits around using phones, computers, and social media. Um, it's the the, uh, the effect on sleep, on mental health, on um, building relationships. It's It's striking. So really trying to get ahead of that a little bit and work with students to build healthy habits. Hmm. All right, thank you, Alexa. Um, just piggybacking up the last comment you made, so that would go into the health curriculum as opposed to like the digital literacy, like, or uh, kind of both, or both. So digital literacy um, is sort of a mix of of teaching students concrete skills and um, how to use the as sixth graders are getting their laptops, how to use that. Um, there's a there is a unit on digital footprint and where even if you think something that you've put on the internet is temporary, how it can show up later. Um, sure. And so I think this is just building on that and really focusing on the interpersonal um, and more on the cell phone piece of things. And I know also to the high school seems to have adopted the, well, for want of Caddy. a better word, the shoe, the shoe, shoe, shoe caddies, caddies with respect to um, cell phones, using it, even going so far as using it to take attendance. Is that something that you guys are considering at CMS? So, um, I don't know about the shoe. Not allowing kids basically no, to have The cell phones aren't allowed out of the locker at the at middle, middle school. school. <laughs> Again, they're not supposed to regardless yeah. of that. There's no lockers, right? No, but they're not allowed out of the backpack. Like yeah. it's far more restrictive at the so. middle school. Okay. The, the rule is more restrictive. Yeah. Execution may have some variation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. but the rule is far more restrictive at the middle okay. school. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and then um, you didn't talk about this, but I'm looking at the document, um, bringing together a grading practice. What is, what does that mean? Sure. Um, <laughs> so I worked with, uh, five teachers uh, over the last two years to do some research about grading, effective grading practices. Mm -hmm. We studied a book uh, called Grading for Equity by an author named Joe Feldman. Um, we looked at five texts and chose that one. Um, and he, uh, along with several colleagues, but he's the main author, he's coming to do a pathway, is that right? Um, spells out sort of these are the five things you can do to your grading to make it more equitable for, for kids and make it more... Um, informational for families. So we chose four practices that we presented to faculty, and we're going to be piloting those in different places next year, and then coming together to decide um, whether those four will be moving forward. I don't know if I should mm -hmm. get into What would an I'm example of one of those yeah. four practices mm -hmm. be? So not taking off points per day assignments are late mm -hmm. is one of them. Um, using codes in Aspen as opposed to zeros when students aren't turning in work. Mm -hmm. Um, right. that mean different things, because I think that's something that is confusing to both kids and, and families. Mm -hmm. um, trying to standardize Aspen categories and really put more emphasis on um, the content learning as opposed to, uh, in the book, he talks a lot about how all these things get conflated. So if a student, um, you know, we have a, a seventh grader who's living at the Best Western right now who may not turn in homework on time, does that mean that she doesn't know reading or that she lost the reading assignment, you know, it's all sort of confused in terms of the English grade. So how do you really give families and kids information about knowledge and understanding as opposed to work habits, mm -hmm. separating the two out a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And that's really talk about the, uh, the most powerful piece, I think is the redo policy. Oh yes. That's number four. Okay. Yes. So we have the, um, <laughs> the codes, um, as opposed to using zeros, uh, the no late work, the, um, retake, Everybody having a similar retake policy, which is all students for major assignments um, can retake it. And there's a lot in the in the book that's interesting about not having to redo the entire assessment, um, having to work with a teacher first in order to improve learning rather than kind of grinding away on the same quiz over and over, um, to redoing a section of a quiz or a test. So offering sections for that. The sixth grade uh, group is going to be piloting that next year. Um, 
Mm -hmm. So it's a pilot that then do you think that the whole school adopt this? Like I do. The next year. <laughs> well, the, I'm optimistic. Next I, yeah, next yeah. year. Yep. Yep. And then but we evaluate adopt. it. You evaluate yeah. and then adopt. You okay. know what was interesting? So we did the, the faculty presentation in March and grading the first chapter of this book, which I highly recommend. It's a great book. Um, talks about how grading is so personal and philosophical mm -hmm. for our teachers and how hard it is to shift practice. So yeah. our committee was nervous for this faculty meeting to kind of see, and people are already trying this stuff out this spring. I mean, I think, you know, after it, um, folks have thought about it a little bit and, and tried it in places, I really, I'm optimistic. I would definitely love to hear a little bit more right. about that as you're going through the process, because I think it's it's really important information for our, our kids and families and, and to make it a learning experience and not just you got a zero right. or you didn't yeah. turn it in. And so there's a missing, assignment. you know, is it an M? Is it a zero? Is it a blank? And yeah. I don't know, like we've all seen it yeah. and sometimes you don't know how to decipher that. So I would love to hear more about that as the year goes on. Absolutely. It's great. Another point about that is that there's groups at the high school also working on the same topic. Oh, great. Yeah. Along with the lines of practices and sort of how you, because it is so different, you migrate from elementary school where you have, you know, one teacher for everything and kids have different teachers and all that. But, um, but, uh, but what, like, how do you guys create practices, like even around like instructional, like delivery? So like, you know, like I notice, like sometimes like one section of a math class will take three weeks on a quadratic ex equation unit and a different teacher for, I don't know the reasons we'll have, you know, one week, four days. Um, and, and just how, like, do you guys look at that? Like in terms of creating practice around sort of everything like this, you know, obviously grading being one, I just, I find it also interesting how to manage that. So uh, teachers who teach the same subject have common planning every six days. I would say that's the the most, and department chairs are involved in that, not every week necessarily, yeah. but periodically. And then in Aspen, it's, um, excuse me, in Atlas, it's the curriculum is tracked with pacing. And then teachers respond to the kids in front of them, I think. Oh, so so yeah. they plan together, like the team. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then what, what's been interesting about the grading is it's lived in departments, which actually mm. isn't so helpful uh, from the family and kid point of view, because just because the sixth, seventh and eighth grade English teachers are all doing it, the kid is seeing different yeah, yeah. across the department. Mm -hmm. So that's this, the pilot is sixth grades trying one thing, seventh grades trying one thing, eighth grades trying one thing, and then the whole school is trying the shared code. So cool. hopefully that'll be apparent. That'll be interesting. I like that. That's great. Thank you. Any other questions on middle school? Super informative. Thank you so much. And now we'll go on to the high school. All right. We're going to, we're really used to sharing things these days. <laughs> the mic. Um, all right. So we um, worked collaboratively with our leadership team. Um, also our coach from challenge success, who we have been working with um, for most of this school year with our leadership team to develop um, this plan. Um, and we also talked about it with our school advisory council um, in our final meeting of the year. Uh, and lastly, we also um, elicited faculty feedback on um, how things went with our school improvement plan for last year and things that, um, you know, they thought that we should continue in our work for, um, for next year. So um, in terms of um, multiple paths to success, um, the first thing we'll talk about is just improving student growth and achievement. Um, we um, are hoping to increase our enrollment in our calculus project, um, our AP classes, um, and our higher level courses um, by 5% for our historically underrepresented uh, student groups. This is something that is really important that um, we would like to see happen next year. I forgot to say that um, we got a lot of student feedback also for this plan. Um, we did student panels with our um, challenge success coach to just hear um, ideas from students um, around some of the things that are incorporated. So that was also really helpful. Um, we're also would like to expand learning opportunities um, 
that are student driven and increase student enjoyment and joy for our students in their learning. Um, a few years ago during COVID, um, our students expressed that they were finding joy in school um, in our challenge success survey, which was really exciting. And that was during a pandemic. And so we think that, um, you know, that's something that we really want to strive to continue for our students and something that we would like to do next year um, that Brian and I feel very strongly is having our faculty shadow a student for a day. Um, our students have a lot of demands on them throughout just a typical school day. And, you know, they make several transitions throughout the day from one class to the next. And we think it's a really important lens um, for all educators to kind of see um, the student view from. So that's something that we're excited about, I would say, for next year. Um, and lastly, for this one, um, maintaining and enhancing resources and opportunities to help students evaluate and think about post-secondary transition. I think um, there's a lot of talk in preparation for our students at the high school level around college. And I think it's really important to also capture and talk about um, other opportunities for students, including trade schools or internships or the armed forces. And something that we heard very clearly in our feedback from students that they really liked that we've done um, a few times and we're looking to really increase opportunities in next year is bringing alumni back and having students speak about their experiences, their personal experiences of um, either things that they did in high school or things that they are now um, doing post-secondary and sharing those um, experiences with our students. Um, they, you know, they can listen to adults talk all day long, but when other students share their experiences, it has a lot more, I would say, cred, so. Yeah. So our... Our second goal um, is all about well-being and mental health. So the first piece, um, you know, we heard is we have a new bell schedule next year. And right, one of the biggest things is all about this flex block that we're trying out on Thursday, which we're really excited about. And certainly a lot of that flex block is a time for students to get extra academic help, but it's also a time for students to connect with other human beings and rest and you have this more social emotional connection. So we are really looking forward to implementing the flex blocks and new schedule with fewer transitions, um, just things starting at normal times at eight o'clock and nine o'clock and 10 o'clock and not 847 and 926. Just, just, yeah. So I think we're really looking forward to um, that piece. Another piece we're working on is with our guidance department is making sure that our students are feel connected and feel able that they can access our guidance counselors. Um, you write from the physical space piece that we've had students describe walking into the guidance counseling office as it feels like you're going to the doctor's office and that you have, it's cold. It's, it's not like going to yours and that the students feel so connected to Kim and Kim and Carlisle <laughs> and Christine. Um, and so what do we want to do? We're thinking about creating space upstairs on the third floor that might be sort of this counseling lounge space. What what can we do in the physical space on the um, second floor as well? So we're working on making sure our guidance counselors and students feel connected. Um, we're also going to continue to identify and address students with emerging social, emotional, and mental health issues. Um, we will be um, continuing with the DESA, which is the social emotional screener next year um, with our ninth graders and having them take it three times a year. Um, we're also talking about piloting a mental health screener with um, a group of ninth grade students. Um, and making sure that we are uh, meeting 100% of students needs who are identified um, as needing interventions and making sure that they're connected to supports and services inside of school. Um, also offering professional development to our staff around social emotional learning um, and trauma informed instruction and grief. Those are areas that have come up um, quite a bit this year. And that's something that um, we know teachers want to learn more about. And so we're committed to doing that next year with them. So our third piece is about um, inclusive culture. And we spent, we're planning to spend some time at 
multiple faculty meetings, offering professional development, about um, working with Andrew, with our DEIB goals. And then the other piece, um, similarly that you heard in all the schools about restorative justice is we're looking at how we want to pilot that. Do you want to add anything about that? Yeah, I mean, I will just say that I think that that's something that um, we've started. Um, a restore, Mr. Miller led a restorative circle with our leadership team, and we've had um, an English teacher pilot it in her classes, and it's something that we feel will be really helpful in building um, a more positive school community um, with our students and um, hopefully seeing it happen um, in classrooms more and more next year. And our last piece is um, continuing to expand our ninth grade academy. We're finishing our third year. Um, and one of the pieces we're I'm really excited about is we spend a lot of time thinking about what skills does a student need to have by the end of ninth grade to be successful for the rest of high school, whether that's note taking or executive functioning. How are you tracking your um, how are you tracking your assignments? So we've decided to break it up by department. So each department has one or two sort of academic skills and then one more social emotional skills. So science is taking care of the note taking, but they're also doing, how do you work well with others? And I think what we've seen is that we're expecting students in the high school to know how to take notes, but we actually never taught them. So it's not really fair or we're expecting them to work well in groups but maybe they did learn it in K, but it looks different now in the high school. And so where I'm so that's going to be a big push for us in the academy is teaching these skills really explicitly in, in addition to the content. And I'll just add, it feels exciting to be at that point um, with our work in the in the academy. I think um, this is something we've been, it feels like we've been talking about and talking about, and now that work is really moving forward and we have a plan, which feels really, really great. Um, and so lastly, around ninth grade, ninth grade academy, um, we're looking to integrate inner cohort practices and protocols. So we meet weekly um, with our ninth grade academy leaders. Um, and so we meet as a group with the admin team and talk about um, the different teams and what's going on. And we have a goal of really um, striving to collaboratively plan agendas um, for meetings and try to just really standardize practices across all four teams um, so that all teams have um, somewhat common practices, have you know, the newsletters that go out at the same time. And so that families and students are all receiving um, information at the same time and regularly from teams. Yeah, I would say that's another piece we're really excited to have Darius and Meg joining us is their ability to actually attend individual team meetings that we've said, wouldn't that be nice? But we just haven't got there. It's just not possible. So, right, with one of being able to go every month or every other week or something. So. That's great. I had a question about um, the Shadow Student Day. So will it start before school? Will it go extracurricular? Will there be buses from Boston and the Outer Banks of Carlisle as we heard graduation the other day? Yeah. Like just to get the full experience of what kids are are seeing, even, you know, I don't know if anyone's been to the high school at drop-off, but even like the stress of like, am I going to make it before the eight o'clock bell rings? You know, just being in a car with someone and, and feeling that. I, I mean, I think that that would be great and certainly an option. Mm -hmm. There's a limit to like contractually yeah. Yeah. where, yeah. how much time people can do. But we we have had teachers who will ride the Boston from Boston and see yeah. that is a long mm -hmm. day. So certainly encouraged, but yeah. can't be required. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, oh, um, I looked at these, the, the ninth grade assigned skills. I think they're so specific. I think they're great. Um, this is probably so obvious, but I just never know. Will the kids be given like these as well? Like at the beginning, like this is what we're expecting you to master. Like, is it, will it be that explicit for the kids so that they can, I don't know, work towards that goal, if you will. So I think right now we're figuring out exactly how we're going to track that. Yeah. Whether we're going to ex all the way to something like a skills-based report card at, like that the middle school has. But I don't think we're there yet by any stretch yeah. of the imagination. But we talked about it just yesterday that 
we are going to track student like let's stick with note taking and okay. so i think students we're going to be explicitly saying we're going to work on note taking and here's a lesson on note taking and it needs to be related to what you're learning in planet earth we're not just going to practice taking notes on like yeah something else like let's do it on work that you have to do and then the next step to that is for teachers to then identify students who haven't mastered note taking by the end of first quarter let's say and then what interventions can we offer now that we have a flex block so what right here's your, you haven't mastered note taking we've taught it and but you right maybe a dozen kids need extra help okay so here's this cut few week session on here's the extra note taking group all right and we offer it and we say, all right, you're going to come once a week for a month to really hone those skills. Yeah. Yep. Fill in it. And then, so, and then like note taking now too is like, it's on your laptop. I'm assuming like we're typing. We're talking a lot about that where there's a lot of research about doing it on by hand and the benefit by doing by hand and how much yeah. more are students learning. Um, so I actually think you'll see a lot of note taking done by hand. So I should be purchasing a notebook. For the child. So, um, <laughs> which I just, you know, haven't done in three years. So just, I just, I know, I, I hear that. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of um, research coming out about when you're taking notes on a computer, you're more acting like a stenographer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Versus there, yeah. Like actually, that research is old. Call, yeah, yeah. It's old. It's old. So it's you not have to like call it like Cornell notes or, right? There's that various forms. Yeah. So. Um, and then can, I can you guys buy one thing, which is that it's our elementary schools that have a skills based report card, not the middle. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 All right. Then my next question is, can you guys really brief? Cause I know it's duplicative. Um, can you give me the structure of ninth grade Academy again? Like when you're doing this, like how often do these guys meet? So how big is the group that they meet in? Who are they meeting with? What, like when? So there's four Academy teams, yep. each with about 80 students and somewhere between four and six teachers and and two guidance counselors okay for each team and then twice a week all of those teachers have they meet and counselors and the guidance counselors yeah. so they'll meet twice a week often one time is more focused about students and student well-being and the other time more focused on um curriculum and co-curricular like Cross curricular experiences, um, field trips, events, yeah, yeah, those types of stuff. So they meet twice a week if you're the adults. Okay, is that? And then the leaders. So each each team has um, a lead teacher, and we meet with the leaders once a week. The admin. Here, yes, I have a couple of questions. One is just to piggyback on what you were talking about. I, and this is not actually about your school improvement plan. I, I am so interested in ninth grade Academy. I would love to have like a broader understanding of it. If that's mm -hmm. not this year, but in the future, next year. putting in that request. You can like, invite us back and we'll come back and talk about it. I would love to hear more about it. Cause I just think it's so interesting how you're thinking about integrating two different communities into one school, mm -hmm. eighth grade into ninth grade. I just, it's really interesting. So it sounds great. Um, my other question is like also less, not really that related to the school improvement plan, but you guys have um, sort of been drinking from a fire hose this year. Um, and now that you're like okay. settled into these new roles, if settled is even fair, um, and you have a new team that's going to be starting, I'm just curious what you need to be successful. And if there's any way that we as a committee or we as a community can help you succeed, um, what that might be. That's really well, no more drinking from a fire hose. That's not how long. It felt great today. So Darius and Meg yeah. came to our faculty meeting. Um, that felt just that in itself felt really good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will say that yes, it's been hard, but we have had incredible support. Like, I mean, all of these guys, right? We're on the same text thread, and anytime you need something, like everyone's just showing up, and we just sort of got thrown in, and it's. Well, we, everyone has been so supportive. So I guess I can't give you something specific now, but I know that there's people around to ask when we need help and everyone's been great. So, and I thank think, you. thank you. And I think we're really excited about 
our new team. And, you know, Darius and Meg, um, I think are going to fit really, really well with us and our philosophy and they're very student centered. And so, you know, we might have some, we, we'll need a little time and space to come together as a team, right. And figure things out. Um, but we're so excited and, um, just can't wait to start and hit the ground running with them. Well, thanks. It's been, you guys have worked really hard and, uh, um, in a gray area. I mean, there's been a lot of unknowns over the last year. So, um, yeah. thank you for everything you've done. Thank you. It's actually been really, it's been great. great. Yeah. But we are super appreciative of everyone's yes. support. So yeah. thank you. And who would have thought a year ago, co-principals would sit at this thing about like, it's, it's great. Yeah. wasn't the plan. We're just really happy to be here. Um, healthy. Yes. If you saw us. In a rough couple of weeks. Um, so Brian's knee and Katie got COVID and we actually ran the high school a couple of days without either of them. If you want to know how deep we're digging these days. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that was lovely. Right, Cynthia? Yeah, we were out on Saturday. So next year is going to feel like an absolute breeze. compared to That's for sure. Yes, sprinkler. Yeah, I definitely appreciate, you know, hearing from all the principals, assistant principals here tonight. It was, oh, you've got another question. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so what you're saying right now, Trade Academy, I, I love it. Um, the one thing as a parent and a kid, I would think, I didn't learn this in middle school. I didn't like to learn this in middle school. They probably are. Yes. The other important thing is uh, that we have the same kind of conversation with Carlisle. Mm -hmm. So they might say, that's not how we roll, or I'm not speaking for the uh, professional, the great team on Carlisle, but it would at least be good to understand and maybe they would give us some good ideas. Um, and then how do you measure how successful you've been with nice day having up until this point? I mean, mm. obviously you're identifying some maybe some people help. Um, but it sounds like overall it's been a great success. Um, I, I think everybody like taking the same science class is huge because I always felt like that was a weird way to end their high school. Um, which I did take biology and take you know science. Um, so, you know, uh, what are the successes of the sound like? What are the two, like, that's I mean, the idea when I hear guidance counselors say that they know more about their student in the first month than they did in a year. Um, and it's not necessarily, we have to work on the student knowing the guidance counselor, but the guidance counselor knows so much because they go to these team meetings. And oftentimes the guidance counselor in the first month is so focused on seniors mm -hmm. that they haven't, mm -hmm. or um, the, our ability to identify students who are struggling. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're very early you're on. across the district of students who are struggling with mental health challenges and that our ability to um, more quickly and that they're not just one in 300 or one in 350, right? Mm -hmm. That they're one in 80. And that you have five-ish five teachers who care so much about them and talk about them twice a week. Um, and that it feels smaller. And I think you might, and that you might, you're going to know more kids in your class. So I think that that's a piece too. I think from the student perspective, something I'll never forget is last year, I personally interviewed 80 kids um, who were rising juniors and seniors um, for the advisory leader positions. And so the rising, so this year's seniors, did not have the academy um, and this year's juniors were the first class to go through it. And so going through that interview process with those students, it was so clear to me um, that the students, um, the junior students who had been through the academy seemed to feel and of course, this is anecdotal, but it, they seem to feel connected um, and just way more secure in a much shorter time than than the seniors. And, you know, just in terms of what they had learned about the school and just learning about the support systems and just having four teachers who, you know, they felt that support, I think, a lot more, which I think goes such a long way in helping kids feel more confident and safe in the, in the transition. Yes, yes, yep. And then one question for both, um, how do you weave in the team teaching model? How do you weave in special education? Um, so uh, working on an extra schedule right now. So. If you can just speak into the microphone, sorry. Okay. Um, as put, I'm putting together an extra schedule right now. So case managers are linked to teams as well. Um, so I try the best I can to have um, 
students link to case managers on Teams so that those case managers are there. And I think that's a it's a really good question because one of the things the the team meetings allows for when you're talking about students who are struggling, oh, yeah. um, one one teacher might <clears throat> say that student struggles. They don't struggle in math, and then everybody goes. What are you doing in math? You know, and and there's a strategy there, or something that the teacher might be able to share, and you're all talking about the same kid. So, um, and the special educator will often say, "Have you tried, you know, <laughs> X, Y, and Z um, thing, or is everybody doing this? Or here's a resource that you can use in order to meet this accommodation." Um, and then it's shared, and the kids are seeing it repetitively. Similar, yeah. yeah. Any other questions from the group? Yes, Carrie. Uh, yeah. Uh, off what Cynthia said earlier, and one of your points here is uh, uh, professional development uh, and including the uh, middle school eighth grade team. Do you have plans to reach out to the Carlisle eighth grade team? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we didn't hire, we, there's only so many things we spoke, lines we spoke about, but we definitely want to think about the middle school, the high school um, alignment, vertical alignment, vertical alignment. And one thing I'm really hopeful for is that with additional early releases next year, it just actually even creates time for teachers to have a conversation when that didn't even exist. And so that, I think that is absolutely with Concord and Carlisle teachers and administrators. So definitely. Anyone else? Well, thank you all so much for being here. I mean, the consistency that all of you have has been great. And really, you have brought the school improvement plans to life. I mean, seeing them on paper versus hearing it from all of you. I mean, we can really see what's happening in our schools. And I loved hearing about restorative circles through, all throughout, you know, elementary, middle school, high school. And it's just the vision is there. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you can definitely feel free to go. So thank you for staying, but we just go. Have you, but please go. I know they were going to stay. <laughs> um, we are on to our school committee self valuation. I will turn that over to Alexa. Great. Um, so last year, this is mostly for you, Carrie. We um, used for the first time an MASC generated tool that they offer to the districts that um, use the MASC to conduct a school committee self-evaluation. It is, um, a, it's a series of multiple choice questions with I think some room for qualitative um, commentary in, in addition to um, the multiple choice questions. I think it was, I liked, we. I think generally the feedback was positive as it gave us a lot of direction. We were able to, from that um, evaluation, really identify um, specific areas where we actually do pretty well. And we were able to identify specific areas where we could improve quite a bit. Um, so we're going to continue to use that tool. You all have it. Carrie, obviously you will not participate in this. Sarah Wilson will, um, or she can elect to. Um, and you, we're going to give you guys a long time. It's, 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 and it's, it's an extensive questionnaire. Um, you know, it does, it's not, you know, entirely out of the norm laborious or anything like that, but um, I'm going to suggest, I believe we all agreed to add a meeting on, a, on August 15th. We will review the evaluation on August 15th. When you complete the link, it will go to Dorothy Presser at MASC. She aggregates all of the data um, and she is hopeful that we she, the due date could be um, August 1st, just so she's got that time before our August 15th meeting to give all the data back. Last year, we had Dorothy and Glenn present the data. This year, I don't think that's necessary. And in fact, um, if you guys all remember what, um, what we did was we categorized I don't know if you guys cared. I did it, but um, uh, all the, like I said, we, all the areas, like these are the five things that we do really well. These are the five that, things that we do mediocre. These are the things we do pretty well. These are the things we're crummy at. So I'm going to offer that instead of having them present, which I think like took an hour, um, instead Dorothy will send us the raw data 
And then um, if you guys would like it, I will do that kind of analysis again. And that, and we can bring that to the August 15th meeting. So again, we'll just, we can, we can skip right to the, you know, what do we, what do we do? Well, what do we do? Not well, et cetera. So that's what I'm proposing. And, um, you guys have the link toward the link that you have, um, in both the agenda overview and the, um, agenda agenda is in fact the live link so when you complete it, it goes right to Dorothy. So that's all set up on their part and they're happy to so engage you can with go us back again. to it. I can't remember. I think you can. Yes, you absolutely you can. Save can. It and go back to it. So it doesn't need to be completed in one setting. Sorry. Court? If it's in the agenda, can anybody hop on it? I was thinking about that. So I might have, um, just as I said it out loud, um, I think, because I, however, it is is that the PDF? Anonymous. We gave the PDF version before. Anybody I can, because I did. Link. I looked at. I looked. Yeah. At. Okay. So I will have Dorothy set us up a new link. new link. It will look just like that, and we will send it out to you guys privately. Court, you to have a. <laughs> Sorry, Court. I'm going to ask you to talk into your microphone because he's going to. Perhaps we can have a link where people could see what we're filling out. Yeah, and now they can. That's we'll get it. To be an ad hoc okay. committee member mm -hmm. joining Sorry. the survey. So yeah. So. Yes. Um, I will get a new private link from Dorothy, but to the community, go and look at the kind of questions we're answering. And um, is everyone comfortable with the timing? Is an August 1st due date acceptable to everybody that gives us about it's August 2nd? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, so <laughs> that would be two weeks before the 15th. So she basically, okay, two weeks. Yeah. okay great. So I think that gives us plenty of time. <laughs> hey, we'll set some reminders because I know that I need them myself yeah. when I forget about yeah. um, deadlines. Despite, we always give these eight weeks and then it's everyone does it in the last five days. Yeah. So um, that, which is fine. Maybe the day before, I don't so know, whatever. Are we meeting in July? Uh, <laughs> we're going, I think we're going to have to. Um, we have I just, to I think it's going, uh, right. Um Court and I are the biggest offenders once again. Court has basically gone for July. I'm gone for some of it. And yeah. Um, After 23rd. Yes. Um, which is, I think, right when the Super I leave for Europe, for Europe on the 24th. <laughs> <laughs> Lori in court this year, I'm off the hook. Um, we're going to have to, um, I think, set up probably a remote meeting for July. Um, I don't, I think meeting in person is likely unrealistic. And we are going to have to accept that a quorum is probably what we're going to aim for. And it's not going to be full participation. Um, and I, and we will get that date. Around it. Oh, I get it. No. And thank you for that. Um, so again, we did officially add the 15th. So we have the 15th and the 22nd in August, 22nd in August. And how about um, we, br we bring a date by next meeting. Is that yeah. comfortable with everybody yeah. and, and knowing it will be remote. It's best be Court, are you going someplace super remote that you can't be remote? <laughs> Did that happen no. last year? Was that a double no. negative? I, I don't when know. I, it was on a bike trip last year. When I travel, my wife looks at me and says, are we going alone? <laughs> Which means, is the laptop coming? Nothing. And I disappoint her every time because the laptop's coming. Uh, no, I'll, I'll have some kind okay. of connection. Okay. Just bring your phone. Just bring your phone. Bring the laptop. All right. Okay. Um, so we'll have that to you. We'll have the additional meeting um, next week. But we'll most likely it. remote. It will 100% be remote. Be remote. Okay. So we meet, is that the thing we're going to meet with the FinCom? Because they brought it up at a public meeting. Oh, um, I have to get with Brusher about that. Okay. We are, it, it's just, okay. I think it will. I just think we can't get dates aligned. It's it's really their dates and our dates. Not every date that he has proposed thus far, that literally doesn't work. I don't even think we can get a quorum. And that's what I've articulated to him. And we just haven't circled back. So... Okay. You, so what what the, what he's trying to do is invite us to his pre-scheduled meetings. No, I understand. None of which work. <laughs> so um, there, there we're we're going to have to push for them on some flexibility, Fine. or or August. Sure. One of the two. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Great. All right. Great. And now that brings us to CCHS campus safety and cell coverage. Um, you should have received an email today that we forwarded on the locations of the potential blue lights. So do you want to share your screens? So yeah, can... and then I was going to tell a, a yeah, little story absolutely. telling you. Um, so this is the updated, there we go, blue light map. I met to Brian, Katie, Peter Kelly, Aaron Jonkis, and I walked around the high school today and took the proposed spots. 
looked at them and actually tweaked a little bit based on the feedback from the actual leaders of the campus. So you'll see the Doug White one is remaining up there by the bathrooms. I have an email into the town manager to um, clear that so that she supports that addition. There's another there on the poles further down the upper ring road um, near the grass spot there. So that's right on one of the poles that's already lined. So what we learned, I think, was clarity. And like when Peter and Derek talk about we already have lines there, what they mm -hmm. mean is we already have electron electricity and in uh, technology to do the wire, the wire, not wireless, wired connection, mostly because of the security cameras we run or the license plate cameras that we run. Mm -hmm. They've already done that work. So the infrastructure's in place. Um, we are looking at one down between the softball, baseball, and uh, Memorial Field. So it's as accessible as possible down there. To, we had some discussion of whether we could run one way out, but then we really have infrastructure to build, and that's much too far and too expensive. But at least down on the lower field, there's easier and better access than there is now. Um, and is that, that's a yeah. that's a slight tweak, that location. Is that true? I don't think that one is. No, no that one we had before. Okay, that was yeah. the, the next, the next one definitely is. Yeah. We had another one on the lower part of the ring road up from the Beatty Center that we're actually going to move up uh, to the amphitheater and right outside the cafeteria. That was a really, I think, strength of the discussion was people are going to run to the building if they're on that side. There's enough activity out there all the time. Um, that just putting one right outside the school that you can not have to worry about whether anybody's in the school and get help made sense. And then the last one is sim is where it was before, um, down on the entrance there coming up from Walden Street. So those are the five. They're very confident that this is doable over the summer. These are now the ones that attach to the pole. They're not new poles that have to be put in or anything like that. Supply so chain. They reduce costs. Cost. Installation's about 16000 plus the cost of the hardware. So we're in pretty reasonable ball game. I don't think we have a hard number on the hardware yet. Um, and this is all doable because the supply chain's not an issue and we have the infrastructure to do it. So we're feeling really good about it. I was with the police and fire chiefs this week and reaffirmed that they are supportive of any and all access over here to help make things easier. So that's great. And I think that, you know, we we've had a few instances this week. So I'm going to ask you to talk about yeah. um, what happened with a bus accident that was and actually Lori and I happened to be at the high school at the yeah, same we time. At the high school. So um, if you want to talk about that, because I think that publicly it's important to know that this really is this is all about safety and it's about um, keeping our campus safe. So. Right. So, you know, of the bus accident, um, middle school bus was rear-ended as it came up Walden to get on Route 2. Uh, and pretty significant accident. The car behind it was total crunched all the way to the driver and all the airbags went off. And thankfully, he, the driver was okay. Thankfully, the children were okay. Let's start with that part. Um at the scene, the fire department cannot release the children to us if they deem it a certain type of accident. And we talked today actually about what those thresholds are versus a little fender bender where they're not concerned about longer term student safety, but a true accident where kids could have got jostled, bumped, chronic conditions, ag agitated, like any of that thing, those things that they don't know at the scene. So trying to get communication, um, John Arena and Justin Cameron went to the scene. I was at the high school. Um, Justin's trying to call me from the scene. I'm down outside and senior breakfast, can't get any signal. I have to go into the building and call. Um, then I'm waiting for them. Initial thought was to bring the kids to the high school, which is a different story as to why that was that later turned into going to Sanborn, but I'm having to be out front up top and trying to wait for the bus to meet them there. I have no cell signal there to continue to try to talk to anyone. And I'm trying to send a connect dead from outside with you know the, the bottom of my triangle as small as it could possibly be and some miracle happened. And I was able to reach families of the bus kids um, with almost no service at all on the wireless or cell signal. So that I'll just consider miracle, <laughs> um, but very challenging, very frustrating um, to not to have that extra layer of like, how am I going to talk to people? When we met with the fire department the day of the accident, the first thing those captains said was we're on route two. We can talk to each other reliably. Talking to anyone else is much harder. And they proceeded to share their own concerns about the lack of cell service along this side of route two. So it's, it's real and it's chronic and it felt really 
impactful that day in terms of how we were being impacted by the lack of service and inability to communicate with each other, with families. And um, I hope we keep talking about how to rectify issues. Peter today did say, Peter Kelly, they're gonna push the Wi-Fi out better at the entrances to try to alleviate some of what I was firsthand mm -hmm. living with there down at below and up above. Um, and then hopefully as a committee, we just keep having more conversations, so. And we have had some communication with the town yeah. about um, they are continuing to investigate options for the town of where they could place right. a cell phone tower. So um, Alexa and I will continue to do that. And I think meeting with the select board would be helpful, the select board chair, just to get a sense of what progress the town has made, because we want to explore all of our options that we have in front of us. Yeah. If the town is looking at one location, is that because the town is working under the assumption that we will put one at the high school? I don't think they're working under the assumption that we're going to put one on there. They know we're investigating it. Okay, because ultimately, um, if it's a town-wide problem, I'm told it's a two-tower solution. Right? Yeah, yeah. It sounds like they're starting to explore other options on this side of Route 2, um, besides yeah. the high school, okay. waiting to see what we do. About the uh, phone installation, is it a simple pickup and go to dispatch? I think it's a button, and it goes right through a speaker to you. Um, and goes dispatch, to dispatch. Yes. So then I think we'll need to solve the problem of how do people in the building know that we've activated EMS? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. Uh, no question. We've had that problem even when cell yeah. phones are able to get through and call 911. For a few minutes. Yeah. Um, um, we've had similar issues with other ways people have called 911. So is, is Peter looking at that? How to. Uh, not uh, built into the. The right. blue light's a packaged product, so I don't right. think there's any option there. We're going to have to talk through messaging that so people know how to reach us. Yeah. What are the next steps on the blue lights? Would we vote, would we put it on next week's or an agenda to vote on whether or not to do it or? Um, you technically don't need a vote because we have purchasing authority, but I'll leave that to the chairs. <clears throat> I mean, if we have purchasing authority, I don't think we need to make a vote on this um, unless someone feels strongly that they'd like to vote on it. It's so not, when, uh, for me, it's not about the money. It's about, uh, do we need an MOU with the Concord police or fire? Um, it feels like it's sort of a new policy. Like court was sort of getting into it where, how do we notify the bill? It, it just feels like I don't, the money is, it's, it's compared to the safety issue. I haven't heard any concerns from the chiefs at all at this point. They're glad there's another option to get help over here. Think about it a little more. I'm just thinking the nuances. Of I mean, we've had people call 911 on other, on any campus, actually, multiple campuses, and the office inside didn't know it happened until no, no, they I, come I get that. I get that. roaring in. It thinks there's a need to figure it out. It's really just another ability to call nine. I see what you're saying, but it also is just another mechanism to call 911. So right. does it warrant more? So this well, is the only thing I'm saying. In infrastructure on our property. Does it change? So it's like I say, putting a phone. Would you have a MOU if you put like three answer. phones? No. Well, so well, the only thing I'm thinking is that, you know, when you go to college campuses, they're making you feel safe primarily from physical sexual assault, right? It's That's the feeling I get when I see the blue lights on a college campus. It's not um, my, I twisted my ankle, I need, uh, you know, Ian has to come help me or something. So I just want to get across to the community. We don't have a high crime rate on the campus. I mean, it's not like it's an unsafe place, but we're putting this here. That's why I'm trying to get yeah, the yeah. messaging. Mm -hmm. messaging out there. Well, and I look at a blue light is if, if, you are having a medical emergency, you go there first. That's what, that's how I see it. I right. see it as- But I think you're right. Like the cultural the thing is about- is, Yeah. I just, women's protection. Women, yeah. 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 I just don't want people to get the wrong, the wrong, excuse me, the wrong message that we have an unsafe place, which we 100% yeah, yeah. do. do not. Yeah. So just, yeah. just making it clear to the community why we're doing this, because we feel like we have a communication problem where yep. people cannot contact yep. emergency services when they need it. So yeah, it's also obvious to us. It's safer, but yeah. it's 
it's not that kind of unsafe. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I, I would like to see an article in the bridge on this, because I think like in the bridge or in the mosquito, just so the community is aware that, you mm -hmm. know, the, these are some of the issues that we have on our high school campus. And That's this is why, you know, like that would be very public statement of this is why we're putting it there. This yeah. is when you should use it. You can pitch that. Yeah. I think we're not trying that. to, I, yeah. I just want to try to surprise people that some people would be like, what is the safety? Now? Right. Right. And I do try and put it on as campus safety and cell coverage, you know, like just as, you know, if you're looking at the agenda item, right, but I think we need to get it, the message out there. The public. Yeah. What other than, like you brought up the bridge, which I think is a good one. What are the other ways in which we could do that? The mosquito. Mosquito. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sarah's on with us tonight. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, great. Yeah. Okay. So those are the two things. Newsletter. Like, newsletter. newsletter. Yeah. 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 Great. But I do hear where Cynthia and, and Court's coming from. What is going to be the internal components of how it works? So when you press the button, the person who's on the other end notifies who within the school? No, as well as police dispatch, they're going to notify within the department. Um, you know, we don't have, I guess, I don't know if this is the way I want to say this, but when police get called, we don't have an automatic to us directly. They handle the incident and someone either is privy to it or witnessing it or they call us after the fact. Well, it goes back so. to what Cynthia's point is it's not a it's not a violent crime situation. It's right. more yeah. of a student that was at the softball game and one of the kids twisted her knee yeah. and they couldn't get the trainer's attention because you she was at the lacrosse field. Right. Yeah. So someone had to run across the field, right. which took time to get someone to come back. So again, it's if someone is gonna use it, it's gonna be for a a, a medical emergency concerning an athlete or a student that's mm -hmm. having an issue. So now you're having the fire department come out to a young person who twisted a knee when the trainer should be the one. I think, yeah, I think to, to that oh, point, the, yeah. the message clarification needs to be, these are for emergencies. Right. I am having a heart it's attack. It's a 911. There, yeah, yeah. There, it, it's a nine, it really is a 911 call. Right. Anything that you would use yeah. a 911 call, which wouldn't be a twisted ankle, but would be cardiac arrest right. is appropriate. But to your point, everyone's point, that messaging needs to be yep. crystal clear. Yeah, yeah. 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 And maybe to set up, you know, maybe you and the chief can come up with a protocol for what happens when you get a call from one of these blue lights, who gets notified, how do they get notified? It would be you. Technically, mostly. it's the SROs. If we don't get a call right. directly, they get notified by the police department. And then within the next hours or it would be the next same as any night. It would be the same call. as any I think it's the gist. Yes. Yeah, so I don't think we need to make new, new protocols yeah. or policies. It would be the existing ones for a 911 call. Right. So we're not reinventing yes. any wheel. We're just providing another means yep. to make a 911 call. That's right. Yeah. That's okay. right. Yeah. All right. Any, some, anything else on that? All right. Um, I, I have a question on the cell uh, tower. Mm -hmm. um, the letter we got today, the a thousand feet from a school building. Can anybody talk to that? Um, we can talk to that a little bit. Do you, do you want no, me to go start? Ahead. Um, so technically the areas are not a thousand feet. So we talked to Verizon and they're about 750 feet. They'd have to measure each area. We only have two viable areas. That third one is not really viable because it's right by where like the shot put area is and there'd be way too much excavation in there. So um, it's behind the lacrosse wall mm -hmm. up there on the grass fields. Um, so what we would have to do is we'd have to apply for a variance to the town of Concord. I believe it's the town of Concord because it is yes. within a thousand feet. And, you know, the messaging from Verizon is this is very common and people do it all the time. It is allowable, but you do apply for a variance. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's one recently approved at the Middlesex School in Concord as well, variance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, and if you drive by, if you want to see, you can see the one at the Middlesex School when you're... Um, driving towards Carlisle, you can actually see it from Lowell Road. And it next is to the hockey. It's right next to the hockey facility. Right. So it's on their campus. Okay. All right. Anything else on that? Nope. All right. Now brings us to our action items. We only have one tonight. It feels like it's a light night with that consent agenda. I love it. Um, and this would be to approve the CCTA bargaining representatives. We talked a little bit about this last week. Um, Sharon, we need a Carlisle member and two uh, Concord 
members. So Sharon has volunteered to be the Carlaw member. I believe that Carrie, you have volunteered and I have volunteered to do um, to be the Concord members on this. So we just need to vote to approve that. So if someone would like to make a motion, then we can have some discussion. For discussion, sure. So moved. Do you have a second? Okay. Okay. So for discussion purposes, any thoughts on the three of us joining the CCTA bargaining team? How soon do you think things will commence? Are we going to reach out to the unit and ask if uh, they're going to start mid-year? Is that what it looks mm -hmm. like? Yeah. I mean, with your input, I, I'd like to reach out early and talk with both leaders so that we get a schedule that's doable, given the scope of the process mm -hmm. here with two contracts. Yeah. And I do think, you know, some of our negotiations this spring too, like they, they can just go on a little bit longer. So we just want to make sure, like, it would be great to just start earlier. Then I think that was the impetus for approving these yeah. so early yeah. because, um, you know, these are tend to be longer negotiations that are, require more um, extensive amounts of meetings. And um, I think it would behoove all of us to get them kicked off you know, earlier than, for example, the ones we kicked off this year. Do you remember last time around when you guys started? It was COVID. I know. It was, usually it's January-ish. Yeah, I think I think we got a slow start in January. Yeah, we've never had both contracts to this fully bargain fully at the bargain same time in a long time. Right, we were very active by March. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ask a question, when did we expire the contracts? They're often three-year terms. They expire at the end of this Next so year. this would be a uh, fiscal 24. Uh, June 30, 24. So you're getting ready for the next contract. Yeah. 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 Yep. All right. Any other discussion? Okay. I'm just going to check to see if Sharon's with us. Sorry. I don't think she's with us. Okay. So we can vote. Just thank you. I'll just say thank you to everyone that is volunteering for this. It's much appreciated because... This is going to be a heavy lift. This is not, this is not a light lift. Thank you all. Okay. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And with that, I will adjourn the Concord Crowell School Committee. So thank you to Carrie. Before they go, oh, before you go, wait, wait, one more thing. One last recognition. Um, we are in the process right now at every building giving out 10, 20, and 30 year recognitions. And Tom, Lucy, RC, What's your title? <laughs> information Chief officer. Information Officer has been here 10 years. And just while he's in the room, we wanted to give him the um, small token of our appreciation. He's done this work a long time and serves hats that sort of vary depending on the need with press connections and covering these meetings and et cetera. So thank you, Tom. We're really thank grateful. You, Tom. Um, It's a really nice pen in a wood box. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Tom helps us with all sorts of things. So we appreciate that. Um, and so with that, I will adjourn the Conquer Carlisle School Committee. Thank you, Carrie. We will see you next week. Bye, Carrie. Bye, Carrie. Have a great night. Bye, Carrie. Um, our lift is also light this evening. We only have our one agenda item. So I would entertain a motion. Nope, oh, sorry. Is there a staffing update? Oh, I apologize. Look at me. Oh, but they were just out of order. Were no, they weren't. No, I just have poor reading comprehension. Right. Okay, sorry. I need to visit Sharon right. Hayne at Willard. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I saw Lori. I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, it was, I missed it. Yep. Yeah. Um, thanks for it. was up there, too. I was in the wrong spot, too. As isn't as is not unusual, the um, enrollment numbers are starting to solidify at CPS. So we're looking at what those are and re-looking at staff needs. Um, so preschool, the numbers are just high. There's no other way to say it. Um, the needs of kids are higher. The needs of the number of special education students is higher. Normally you're watching in a preschool how many kids are exiting out at grade at age five. So that as the kids age up into age as they turn three, you've got some flexibility there. And we just simply don't have very many upcoming kindergartners. So three year olds increasing. Is that like they just well so the number of kids who are staying on as not kindergarten eligible yet, but oh. older Understood. is more static. So we're not losing so we're retaining some five year olds. We're retaining kids who are not yet five okay. but have special needs and need to stay in the program. 
Um, and yes, of course, we're gathering upcoming three-year-olds at the same time. So that is the storm that creates the need for more preschool slots. The um, raw numbers are higher. The raw numbers are higher, which has been building and we're finally at the place we can't eke it out another year. So we're going to add a preschool teacher and create a fifth section. It'll be a one-year position because we have to see if this pattern's the new pattern or is it a blip of mm -hmm. need and it'll reduce. Um, it will be an integrated setting. So there'll be some regular education tuition subsidy there. We haven't quite settled on the size of the room yet. Mm -hmm. um, sort of evaluating the needs of the kids. What, what is the class size there? Uh, you can go as high as 15 legally. That's not generally the number we aim for. So we were actually over it, which is why we've made this decision. So now we have to look at how we're going to reallocate. Um, and we have a combination of full-time and part-time programs. We haven't settled on whether this will be full or two part-time we're trying That's to sort gonna, all that out. So you have, there's still the morning and afternoon sessions or the full day session? Right. So, so we haven't five made sessions, that. But you're not sure. Right. So right now we run three full day and two half. Okay. So the question is, do we add another two half days, which obviously gives us quite a bit of growing mm. room. The trick there is if you get a student with substantial needs that needs the full day, we don't have that spot. So we haven't sorted all that out yet. Okay. Um, the second need is kindergarten at Thoreau. Uh, we had budgeted three sections and there's that's not going to hold. Um, we're already up over 60 kids. Wow. wow. Right. So that, I don't know what to say other than that's building itself and we need to go to four sections. These move-ins, are they new? Are they people late to enrollment? Is it this? No, this is early. I mean, oh. late to enrollment's the Just stuff that trickles in over the summer. Um, these are the folks coming in right on time. They've been to orientation. The numbers at the row in K had been down the last couple of years and maybe it's bubbling back. Maybe it's a bubble group. We don't yeah, know, yeah. but okay. definitely the numbers are there to support a fourth classroom that was not budgeted for. Um, so do you have a, do you have three, sorry to interrupt you. No, no. Since you have three kindergarten teachers this year, would you have three first grade next year or we are, and that's what we budgeted for. So, oh, I see what you're saying. We already took that reduction. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And Carrie, some years what happens is if there's like four sections of kindergarten, then and the numbers stay the same for the next year's kindergarten. That sometimes the teacher will go up to first grade. So then there's four sections of first mm -hmm. grade, like the, like the class that just graduated. That was the bubble class. Yeah, and that class was just big yeah. all the way through, and and there was always yeah, added. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, we're, we're going to need a kindergarten assistant there too, um, to support that classroom. So I'm not sure preschool, I want to look at reallocating before we add support staff. So more to come on that. Um, so those are CPS budget impacts. The third is, uh, because of the hotel, the, sh the shelter, we've uh, assessed the incoming kindergarten in the long-term stay families. We're still having this supposed distinction between long-term and short-term so of the families that moved in in March, originally from Devons, those are the long-term stay families that Desi sees us responsible for. There's three incoming kindergartners. They're four-year-old right now, and there's significant language needs there. We're sorting out whether the quote-unquote short-term stay families, where we now know there's six to seven other incoming kindergartners are going to be our responsibility. Desi has said they won't be. DHCD has said they would move those families as needed. So I'm I'm meeting with them Friday. We're going to have to ask some more questions, but we know we have at least three. Um, so that's going to tip potentially 10. I guess that be, and they've I promised us we're not going to have that much impact to us. So I'm be all willer. Well, depends on if it's 10, but I don't suspect they've been really adamant with me. They're not going to do that. So, so, so this is a little off subject, but I've think nonetheless sort of germane is uh, have have my understanding and uh, I don't even know where I'm basing this understanding off of I guess just discussions with residents so there are long-term stay families but there do remain families who are fluid that come in for a short time and exit that's what I'm trying to find out so because yeah, last time we met with the DHCD they was, named that the short-term stay wasn't really working and when they realized they had families that had been there a month and those kids hadn't been to school, they quickly moved those families to other places. 
I suspect the same thing. These other families with this other six or seven, four to five, four soon five-year-olds are going to get moved so that we don't have impact. Okay. But I have not we confirmed don't that. Yet. Okay. Yeah. So they may get moved. What I think we've realized it's really helpful in our end if we name the problem. So DHCD sees that there's incoming potential impact on the schools and then they address it. So and can I just ask a question about ELL needs? Can you just well, yeah, that's what I was as working as to. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what is the requirement? Well, so the newcomers, the non-English speaking kids need two hours a day. A day, yeah. yeah. Level one and, yeah. One. and that's yeah. one on one, two hours a day. It doesn't, it doesn't have, have one to be, two, but, but yeah. generally their home language and their yeah. level of need for English means that we have to do it one on one. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you can hear where I'm going here. Yeah. We're going to tip the scale here at Willard and I have to add a teacher, which we've been sort of hovering at really all along. What I feel pretty strongly in saying is that we're about to start collecting state subsidy for per pupil for the kids who've enrolled here. And I think there's room to say that between the family coordinator and that per pupil for elementary, um, we'll be subsidizing the ELL teacher. So we this, those two positions, I think, is where I would say that money's going once we start collecting the average so, per pupil on the kids who've enrolled. Would those be, would you, like, similar to what you were doing with a preschool teacher, would this be a one-year? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because if the hotel closes, we don't have the same need. Yeah. So we're posting it that way. And that you set up a contract for that so the so the employee understands this is potentially short term we do it all the time usually yeah. it's um, maternity leaves <laughs> but okay. it's the okay. same okay. okay structure so then what are, are what we're talking about is a potential increase of four ftes at cps one at the preschool one at K teacher lead at Thoreau plus an aide plus an ELL. Yes. And they're all full time. Yes. Okay. And the ELL will come with funding offset for the homeless. Um, yeah, it'll be offset. And preschool will come with regular ed tuition offset, so a little bit. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if we should create some sort of memo to the finance committee to give them. You know, because one of the things that I think we could be doing all along is as these needs come up, I'm like very appreciative that we got this update so quickly. We did just wrap up this budget and um, <laughs> it does demonstrate how fluid the the needs in a, in a school environment can be. So um, I'm just thinking maybe we construct a quick memo to share with the finance committee. I know that they usually have a rep. Marlon's on. Oh, Carlin's on. So I don't know, Carlin, maybe I'll, as the um, liaison, I can talk with you about whether you think a formal memo would be necessary, but regardless, I, I do want to make sure that we continue to mm -hmm. um, ensure they're apprised of these right. changes. And obviously our job is to bring to you how that's all going to be funded right now. We're in the thick of the hiring for the fall and really looking to find savings there. We had later one or two late retirements that we weren't sure how those pools would be and what we could do there, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll be bringing you that. If we could, like Dr. Hunter just said, if we could just be sort of a the retirements, the reimbursement, you know, so if we could see it perhaps at the next meeting, we just yep. discuss it. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we present it next meeting, we'll be presenting you that we have a problem we haven't solved. Like, well, I think we need a little bit more time. Yeah, I do too. Okay. That. Our July then. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, like, a, so how we're gonna a fund it? Memo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. At July meeting. <laughs> okay. Great. I think that's wise. I think that's good planning. Appreciate it. Well, and I'll just say the thank you because the support of the budget that passed allows us to know there's ways to figure this out if we had gone much deeper in cuts, that would have been much more challenging. So All right. Thank you. It's good to get these updates as they're happening. Yeah. 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 Appreciate Definitely. that. Um any questions from anybody? No? Sure. By once. 
Um, okay, so then um, we can move on to our final action item of the evening, which is a vote to approve the CTA bargaining representatives. Again, I will thank court for volunteering. Um, I am volunteering. Uh, so if I could get a motion to approve court and I so that we can have some discussion, that would be appreciated. So moved. Oh, second. <laughs> Great. Um, Today. Is there any discussion? Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate um, I appreciate everyone who stepped up to the plate. It's important. Um, any other discussion? All right, non-controversial and boring. Um, all right, all in favor of Court and I as your CTA bargaining representatives. Aye. 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 With that, I'll let us go. Exactly.